Hello, this is Dr. Hannah Asil, and today we're doing the Unit 3 January 2020 paper for the IAS Chemistry at Excel. The first question was, tests were carried out on some pairs of compounds. Bromine water was added to separate solutions of sodium chloride and sodium iodide. State one different observation for each reaction. You should realize that sodium chloride, when, it react, when bromine water is added to it, actually there should be no reaction because bromine is less reactive than chlorine and will not displace it. Remember, in the group 7, chlorine, bromine, iodine, chlorine is more reactive than bromine, so it will not be displaced by the bromine, so there is no reaction. But the bromine water in itself is a reddish brown or an orange solution. If I add it to the sodium chloride, remember the sodium chloride solution, there is no transition metal in this case, so it is a colorless solution. So if I add bromine water to a colorless solution, the colorless solution will turn orange because of the presence of the bromine water, not because there is any reaction. Actually, there is no reaction. Now, when I add the bromine water to sodium iodide, now in this case, bromine is more reactive than iodine. It will displace it, so the iodine in the solution is brown, so the colorless solution of sodium iodide will turn brown. Then he says, name a test with the expected observation to confirm the presence of sodium ions. Now, what is the test that we have for sodium ions? We have flame test. And with sodium, it turns into a yellow flame. Barium chloride solution and hydrochloric acid were added to separate solutions of ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate. The first thing you're going to ask yourself, barium chloride is a test for what? You should realize that barium chloride is a test for sulfate. So... If I add it to a solution of ammonium sulfate, he's saying state what would be seen. If I add it to something that has sulfate, it gives a white precipitate, while ammonium nitrate, which doesn't have any sulfate, will give no change. Then he says, give a test with the expected result to confirm the presence of the ammonium ion. What was the test for ammonium ion? We said add dilute sodium hydroxide and warm gently. What do we get? Bubbles of gas that turn damp red litmus to blue. This is the test for ammonium ion. Then he says acidified potassium dichromate solution was added to two test tubes, each containing a different alcohol. First of all, acidified potassium dichromate is what? You should realize that that is an oxidizing agent and it oxidizes alcohol. Now, he says the test tubes were placed in a warm water bath. Alcohols were propane 1 all and 2 methyl propane 2 all. State what would be seen. Now, the first thing that we need to think about is what are these alcohols? So, propane 1 all is this alcohol. It is a primary alcohol. Remember when the OH is attached to a carbon that's attached to only one carbon, that's a primary alcohol. Now, 2-methylpropane to all is a tertiary alcohol. Remember the OH is attached to a carbon that is attached to three other carbons. Now, what does uh, acidified potassium chromate, dichromate do to a primary alcohol? With a propane 1 all, propane 1 all is a primary alcohol, it will be oxidized first to an aldehyde and then to an acid. So there is a reaction with potassium dichromate. Remember that when potassium dichromate reacts, it turns from orange to green. While the tertiary alcohol, you should remember that the tertiary alcohol cannot be oxidized. So when I add acidified potassium dichromate, there is no change or it remains orange. Give a chemical test with the expected observation to confirm the presence of the hydroxy group. Okay, what was the test for presence of OH? The test that we have for presence of OH is add 
phosphorus pentachloride or PCL5, you should get steamy white fumes if you have something that has an OH. So this works for an alcohol and it works for an acid. Remember that the acid also has an OH somewhere. Or you could say add sodium. Well, sodium also would react and give effervescence because it gives hydrogen gas. Acidified potassium manganate was added to separate test tubes containing samples of hexane and hexene. Uh, remember that potassium manganate also is an oxidizing agent, so it also would oxidize alcohols and do the same kind of reactions that the dichromate did in the previous question. But here we're reacting it with an alkene and an alkene. So remember that potassium manganate reacts with which of these? Potassium manganate can also react with an alkene. So if I react it with the alkene, there is no reaction. But with an alkene, remember with an alkene, potassium manganate will form a diol. And that means that the potassium manganate itself will turn from purple to color. A class of students carried out experiments to determine the enthalpy change for the reaction of magnesium metal with hydrochloric acid, and this method was used. One meter length of magnesium ribbon was cleaned using sandpaper, weighed, cut into 10 centimeter lengths. 50 centimeter cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid was placed in a polystyrene cup, and he's telling you that the acid is excess. He measured the temperature. 10 centimeter length of magnesium ribbon was added to the hydrochloric acid. The solution was stirred gently and the maximum temperature recorded. And this is the equation for the reaction. Then he measured this. What did he measure? He measured the mass of the one meter ribbon, the initial temperature of the hydrochloric acid, the final temperature of the solution. Now calculate the number of moles in 10 centimeter length of ribbon notice that he weighed one meter of ribbon and this was 0.86 grams but then he cut it into 10 centimeter lengths and this is what he used for the experiment so the one meter is 0.86 so the mass of the 10 centimeter is 0.086 grams okay and that is the mass that we use to get the number of moles. So the number of moles is mass over molar mass or molecular mass. So that is 0 0.086 over the 24.3. And this gives you the number of moles of magnesium that he used. Now calculate the enthalpy change for this reaction, including a sine and unit. How do we calculate the enthalpy change? We said first we get Q, which is the quantity of heat. Q is mc delta T. M is the mass of the solution. If you remember, we used 50 centimeter cubed of the acid, so that is the mass of our solution. C is the specific heat capacity, which is a constant number that he gives me, 4.2. And the delta T is the difference in temperature, which is the 29.2 minus the 21.4. And I get a certain quantity of energy, and this comes out in joules. Then he says calculate the delta H. You should know that delta H is Q over N. So we're going to divide that Q. Uh, actually, we changed it from joules to kilojoules. So you divide it by 1,000. And then you divide by the number of moles. You get a certain number in kilojoules per mole. But you have to put a sign. Now, how did I decide that it's a negative sign? This is because the initial temperature went up. That means increase in temperature is exothermic reaction, and exothermic reaction has a negative delta H. Then he says the maximum uncertainty each time the thermometer was read was 0.1 degree Celsius. Calculate the percentage uncertainty. Again, when we measure percentage uncertainty, we said what, how do we do that? It is the 0.1 times 2, because we're going to measure it twice in the initial and once, once in the initial and once in the final. So you multiply that by 2 over the temperature that we're measuring times 100. And the uh, percent uncertainty comes out in a plus or minus uh, something percent. So this is our percent 
uncertainty. Remember that when he gives me a certain percent uncertainty, if I'm measuring this uh, factor, for example, temperature twice, or we said in a burette, we measured the initial and the final, then the uncertainty is multiplied by two over the number that you're uh, talking about. So that is the temperature difference times 100. So just one way of reducing the percentage uncertainty in measuring the temperature. So how can we um, decrease the percent uncertainty? This is if we use larger numbers. So a larger mass of magnesium or a smaller volume of the acid would give me a larger number. So the larger, larger the number, the smaller the percent uncertainty. One student carried out the same experiment but used a glass beaker instead of a polystyrene cup. Now, what effect would that have? Remember that the polystyrene is an insulator. So if I use glass, this will allow more loss of heat to the environment. So the heat change will be less exothermic. So it's as if the number for the delta H is a smaller number. Explain why the magnesium ribbon was cleaned with sandpaper. Remember, whenever he says we clean something with sandpaper, it is to remove anything that's on top. So the magnesium usually has a layer of magnesium oxide, uh, which would give a different enthalpy change. An experiment was carried out to determine the purity of solid sodium carbonate. The following procedure was used. 4.89 grams of impure sodium carbonate was weighed and dissolved in distilled water. The solution and washings were transferred to a 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. The liquid level made up to the mark. A pipette was used to transfer 25. So he's making a solution of sodium carbonate, he put a certain mass in a 250 centimeter cube volumetric flask, and then he took 25 centimeter cube portions of that. Each portion of solution was titrated with hydrochloric acid that has a certain concentration. Now, that means that what did we have in the uh, flask? We had the sodium carbonate. Now, the indicator we put was methyl orange. So what color change would we have for methyl orange when I put it in something that's uh, basic, that is yellow to orange? Remember, at the neutral, at the end point, the methyl orange is orange. Then he gives these readings and he says, complete the table and using appropriate titrations, calculate the mean titer. In order to calculate the mean titer, the first thing we do is we choose, um, first of all, we have to calculate actually the volumes. So these are the volumes. And then we choose which ones are concordant. Now, concordant, we said, means within 0.2 of each other. So which of these numbers are within 0.2 of each other? It's the 26.1 and the 26.2. So these are the ones that we use to get the average titer or the mean titer. So that comes out to be 26.15. Then he says, calculate the percent purity of sodium carbonate. Now, remember that in order to calculate the percent purity, I have to calculate, first of all, what was the theoretical mass that we should get, and then we can calculate the percent purity. So what we have is information about HCl. So we get the number of moles of HCl, concentration times volume. This is the information he gives me, times the volume that we got from the titer that we did the average of. Remember that that was in centimeter cubed. So we have to divide it by a thousand before we put it into the equation. And this gives me a certain number of moles of HCl. Then I go back to the equation and I relate the number of moles of HCl to the number of moles of sodium carbonate. Obviously, from the reaction, one mole of sodium carbonate reacts with two moles of HCl, and that means that the number of moles of sodium carbonate is half of the number of moles of HCl. So I can get the number of moles of carbonate. Now, from that, that was the number of moles in 25 centimeter cube that I used for the titration. But I want the number of moles in the total 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. So I get that from relating it 
um, this number of moles in 25, so how many in 250? So that comes out to this number of moles. And then I can calculate the mass. The mass is number of moles times MR. Of course, the MR is that of sodium carbonate that we calculate. And this comes out to be 2.77 grams. So the actual mass of the sodium carbonate in what we used is 2.77. That means my, and what he weighed actually was 4.89. So the percent purity is the actual mass of the sodium carbonate that I calculated divided by what he weighed, the total impure carbonate that he calculated times 100, and that comes out to be the percent purity of 56.7%. Then the next question says, bromoethane can be prepared by reacting ethanol with a mixture of sodium bromide and concentrated sulfuric acid. So he says in step one, five centimeter cubed of ethanol, five centimeter cubed of water are added to a round bottomed flask. The flask is placed in an ice bath. Five centimeter cubed of concentrated sulfuric acid is added slowly. During this process, the flask is shaken gently. And the first question says, explain why the sulfuric acid must be added slowly. You should remember that sul concentrated sulfuric acid is very corrosive. I don't want it to boil over since the reaction is very exothermic, so that would be very dangerous. Then in step two, he says six grams of solid potassium bromide is ground up into a fine powder using a pestle and mortar. The powder is then added to the round bottom flask containing ethanol and concentrated sulfuric acid. So he is adding the potassium bromide to the mixture of ethanol and concentrated sulfuric acid state why the potassium bromide is ground up to a fine powder of course we always use things in powder instead of large lumps or pieces because powder has larger surface area for faster reaction then he says the group the crude bromoethane now that he has reacted them together now it, the bromo the ethanol has now become bromoethane and i need to distill it off so draw a label diagram to show the apparatus suitable for distillation. What was the diagram for distillation? You should have a round bottom flask, uh, which you're heating. It should have a thermometer. It should be connected to a condenser and some sort of receiving flask. And remember that the condenser water goes in from the bottom and goes out from the top. Then he says, state how anti-bumping granules pre prevent bumping in the distillation flask. So we should have some anti-bumping granules in the flask. This is to prevent formation of large bubbles, to allow even boiling or to prevent it from um, splashing out or spitting out of the uh, flask into the condenser. Then step four says the distillate from step three is transferred to a separating funnel where it separates into aqueous layer and a layer containing the impure bromoethane. State two physical properties of bromoethane that can be deduced from this diagram. Remember the bromoethane here is the lower layer and the lower layer means that that is the one that has higher density than water. And since it formed two layers, then we say that it is immiscible with water. Describe how the aqueous layer could be removed from the separating funnel. Remember, when we have separated the two layers in the separating funnel, how do we uh, get them out? We open the tap, we allow the bromoethane layer, which is the lower layer, into a beaker and then close the tap. That leaves the aqueous layer in the funnel. Step five says, after removing the aqueous layer, sodium hydrogen carbonate solution is added to the impure bromoethane in a separating funnel and the two layers separated again. Now, why are we adding sodium hydrogen carbonate? Remember that we usually add sodium hydrogen carbonate to neutralize any excess acid that is still present in the um, mixture. Then he says, step six, the bromoethane is placed into a sample bottle and a drying agent is added. 
identify by name or formula a suitable drying agent. Remember that anhydrous calcium chloride is usually used as a drying agent. Describe how the appearance of the bromoethane changes after the drying agent has been added. Remember that a solution that has water in it is usually cloudy. Now, if you add the anhydrous calcium chloride, the cloudy solution becomes clear, and that shows that the water that was mixed with it has been absorbed. And that's the end of the paper. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, thank you for listening.